This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. And this is Money Talks from MPB Think Radio. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Nancy Lotridge Anderson, president of New Perspectives, and Ryder Taft, portfolio manager at New Perspectives. They're both chartered financial analysts. Ryder holds the Certificate in Investment Performance Measurement from the CFA Institute. So we've got a variety of financial scenarios to talk about today, and maybe one of them speaks to your financial mindset. Contact us by email. Our address is money at mpbonline.org. Good morning, Nancy. What uh, financial news do you have for us this week? Good morning, Kevin. Um, I've been watching this ill-thought-out proposal to do away with the state income tax. And uh, a few years ago, um, we made a change in our tax structure here in Mississippi to encourage retirees to land here. So any retirement income, uh, pensions, draws from IRAs, 401ks, those are not taxed at the state level. And so this proposal to do away with the state income tax means they're going to have to shift the burden over to the sales tax. So if you're a retiree, you're going to end up paying more in sales tax and um, and just because of this change. And so I would encourage those retirees to call their legislators and say, wait a minute, I don't want to pay higher taxes. Uh, Let's keep the structure as is. So that's a bit unusual that that you would, you know, make a situation that's attractive to to retirees and then turn around and do something that's not. Do you think that, that maybe they've lawmakers haven't made that connection? Well, it sounds like they have not. Um, I don't think they understand what they have done with this. And uh, to do away with this um, plum that they've offered to retirees to encourage them to settle in Mississippi uh, doesn't seem reasonable. Well, that's something that we will definitely track uh, as we make our way uh, closer to uh, January and the beginning of a new legislative session. But uh, that has been a hot topic, so something we'll definitely keep our eyes and ears on. So, Ryder, it's your turn. What financial news are you thinking about this week? Good morning. I am just looking ahead. This weekend it will mark the 20th anniversary of 9-11, which was, of course, a terrorist attack on America, but it impacted the finance world a lot because, of course, the World Trade Center was where a lot of finance companies were located. And I know it might be a little bit weird for me to be bringing this up. I was just in middle school at the time. I didn't really understand the significance, certainly when I first heard of it you know, in school. Um, we, we had a half day. I mean, that was the significant part for me. But working in finance, you can't help but meet people who were in New York at the time, people who were in the towers at the time, people who, who, who lost loved ones or friends or colleagues. And there's always just an outpouring of such personal stories about what happened that day. And one of the stories that strikes me, there's a firm that was a a bond trading firm, Cantor Fitzgerald. They lost, I believe, something over two-thirds of their workforce that day, but they bounced back. They came back. They're now a primary treasury dealer, uh, and, and that really highlights the resilience uh, in American finance these days. Firms relocated. They moved from the downtown Wall Street area to Midtown. They spread out a little more, and now we're even more decentralized. Um, There are something like, I always say, something like 27 or 30 different trading venues in the United States, and and they are not just located in New York and Chicago anymore. So trading can continue to happen, and we saw that resilience play out last March when everyone had to go home all of a sudden, including trading desks. So people were trading these things were happening from all over all over America. It's a lot more it's a lot more computerized now. It depends a lot less on actual humans pushing those buttons, but the resilience of the finance industry, so people always kind of worry about oh, what's going to happen to, you know, if this firm what what's going to happen to this firm? What's going to happen if we can't place trades and and so far the evidence shows is, is finance has been very very good to adapt and continue to offer services and and protect the investors. 
Very good. Uh, I just wanted to remind everyone, um, again, we talked about this a lot on the air and, and, and not on this show, but I think it's popular discussion to avoid the, the scams and phishing things. Um, and I, 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 I think it was a text message or an email. I don't remember what it was, but it was from Venmo or something. And it was like, oh, you need to update your this before we do that kind of thing. And um, I charged right in and got about to the middle name or whatever, or maybe even when it asked for my social security number, and then all of a sudden I was like, wait a minute. Uh, so I don't know if it was legitimate or not, but it's like I, I don't think that gathering that sort of sensitive financial information via email or text messaging is, is, a, is a way to go anymore because people, you know, have been conditioned to be very wary of that. So fortunately, like I said, before I even got any kind of uh, personal financial information in there, I thought, nah, uh, you know, what, what's the worst that could happen? I lose my Venmo account. There's eight zillion other, you know, ways to do that. So uh, just a reminder, stay diligent. Uh, and I think we're so used to these things and it looks legit. You'd go ahead and do it. But again, take Take a moment and, and uh, double check, make sure that you think something's legitimate. And again, I think the best advice I've heard about that is uh, go ahead and contact whoever it is directly and make sure that what they're, you know, what, what they, it was legitimate uh, request for information or what have you. So. <clears throat> So if you're like many parents, you put off saving for college because other expenses and financial goals were more important at the time. But as the years went by, you may have put some money away, but not as much as you wanted. So, Ryder, what suggestions would you have for a parent who might be in this uh, type of a situation? Yes, and that's always very interesting. We, when we get that a lot, we get that from people who are planning to become parents. We get that from people who are new parents. We get that from people who have 18-year-olds. So we get that all throughout the range. And I think the first thing, especially with a newborn, is continuing to prioritize a couple of other things. One, continuing to prioritize just your basic financial security. And this is something we always say is the number one thing. Make sure you have cash on hand. Make sure you're not, you don't have excessive consumer debt, particularly high interest credit card debt. Make sure those things are taken care of because if you have just a, a ton of, of credit card debt and you let that ride for 18 years, that's going to be a lot more expensive than a college education. And while you might get an education from that, it's, it's not the same. You don't get a degree for paying off your Amex card too late. Uh, another thing is make sure you continue to prioritize saving for retirement. And, and not necessarily – sometimes people can save a lot more than they necessarily, quote-unquote, need to. So if you are saving a lot, if you're saving 25, 20, 25 of your income for retirement, you can dial that back in order to save some for, for college. But again, make sure you are doing – uh, plenty of retirement savings. We often say 10 to 15 percent saving over your career for your own retirement, 10 to 15 percent of your income. So there's a lot of uncertainty with future college costs is one reason. We know they have increased at a much higher rate than most other things. However, college finance and how we pay for college has changed so much. It's changed so much in the past 10 years. Student loans haven't even had interest for the past two years, for the past year and a half. There's talk of broad forgiveness. There are already way, methods in place to offer forgiveness to pretty much anyone who gets federal student loans. So they are, at, while they can be burdensome, they are actually a fairly good deal. There's so many different ways to pay, you know, scholarships, student loans. You could do the community college, trade school, all sorts of different ways of doing it. And you just don't know when you only have a newborn. So it makes sense to put away some because time of course, with compounding on the growth, time really helps there. But again, this is not going to be your number one priority. Yeah, and a couple of things you said there I thought were good points. Uh, you know, the idea of community college, a lot of ways you could go there. Community college is cheaper. You can get your sort of your basic uh, classes out of the way, and then if need be, uh, transfer to a four-year college to specialize in whatever degree you want. And then, as you mentioned, don't ever forget about uh, financial aid and scholarships. A lot of scholarships out there for a variety of different types of students. So that's uh, something that you should investigate as well. And then you talked about also the, the 529 plans that Mississippi has to offer. So. 
If you have a question for our experts, send an email to money at mpbonline.org. We're talking about financial situations this morning. You're listening to Money Talks on MPB Think Radio. Susan Buttress, Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Mississippi Medical Center and host of Southern Remedies Relatively Speaking. Join us as we explore issues that relate to you and your family, from mental health obstacles and family interactions to handling life disruptions. Whatever the issue, let's try to figure it out together. You can listen live Tuesdays at 11 on MPB Think Radio, or you can subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy on your preferred podcasting app. The information presented on Money Talks is meant to provide general information about the topics discussed and is not necessarily the opinion of Mississippi Public Broadcasting. The information presented does not create any type of relationship between the hosts and guests and the listening audience. Please consult a financial advisor or any other qualified professional for guidance about your personal finance questions. You're listening to Money Talks. Our website, moneytalks.mpbonline.org, is one way to hear past Money Talks broadcasts. You can also download the MPB Public Media app. Then you get to listen on your iPhone or Android phone to all the local MPB Think Radio programs on your schedule. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Nancy Lottridge Anderson, president of New Perspectives and Ryder Taft, portfolio manager at New Perspectives. We're talking about various financial situations you might find yourself in throughout life. Uh, but first, though, we did have a caller who uh, had a comment about uh, Nancy's uh, th- thoughts on the uh, loss of income tax. And the the caller did want to point out that uh, I think in the proposal um, is um, a uh, to lessen the sales tax on groceries uh, to half of the 7% would be 3.5%, and that might be a, a little bit of a uh, way to offset any sort of um, – that might help out senior citizens and act- anyone who's, who does grocery shopping. So, Nancy, have you heard that, that that's part of the proposal to cut sales tax on groceries? Well, I knew there was in the proposal to try to um, alleviate some of that burden in areas where – uh, families uh, or like with groceries but you know I'm still left with this notion of you know math is a difficult thing Kevin if you get rid of the income tax you have to make it up somewhere okay so you can lower the tax burden on groceries but it's going to have to be made up in these other places um, if I'm a retiree and my only expense is groceries, then I may come out ahead. But chances are I'm buying other things as well. So I, I, I'm not sure what they're thinking in all of this. And um, income tax seems more reliable from year to year as a way to budget than does sales tax, because sales tax does fluctuate with consumer spending. Right now we're seeing consumer spending dropping a bit because of the Delta variant. We certainly saw it uh, a year and a half ago when we all went into shutdown. So I just have concerns about this whole shift that they're trying to do. And of course, the claim is this is going to make us more attractive out there to not have income tax. Um, but we still have to pay for things. 
Uh, as I said, this will be certainly in the news uh, as we approach the beginning of the legislative session in January, so uh, plenty of time to see where they go and to continue to monitor what's happening with uh, the uh, proposal to uh, eliminate uh, the state income tax here in Mississippi. So we are talking about various financial situations. Uh, Nancy, this next one, many of us are at the stage of life of having to support aging parents financially. How can an adult uh, dealing with this situation do? What can they do to help out? Boy, Kevin, this is very personal for me right now because this is what my family is going through. And, um, you know, it, it gets difficult because you have to bear in mind that your parents are adults and they're making their own decisions. Um, you first have to look at are they still able to manage their own finances? Are their faculties such that they can keep track of everything and, and you're okay to stay out of it? But the other problem that we see a lot is we see people having cognitive issues and they're not able to manage their finances. Um, so it becomes very touchy to have an adult child step in. First of all, that adult child has to recognize that there's a problem, and often they don't because, you know, those parents are keeping that quiet and, and don't want people to know they're having trouble. But then you, when you step in, your parent has to give you permission to step in. Uh, short of going to court and setting up a conservatorship, you have to – they have to say, it's okay, uh, I, I can't manage this anymore, and I want your help. The other thing that happens is at some point, um, because of aging parents' needs, you may have to have a conversation about what, what their whole financial picture looks like, what can they afford to do. And what we encourage our clients to do starting you know, in their 60s, 50s or 60s, is to start to talk to their adult children about their financial situations to start to gradually reveal everything because at some point you're going to have to sit down and put it all on the table as you figure out what can you do to make sure their needs are met and talking about different housing situation and again that's difficult you know I'm having that same issue right now where I think I know what's better for my parents but it's still their choice and they may choose to go a different route and I have to understand that that's what it's going to be. But certainly, um, you need to talk about money. And in some families, that's very difficult where it's always been a taboo situation. And, you know, you don't talk about all that stuff. But it's really important to lay it all on the table. We tell our retired folks, you know, you're more likely to be together and something could happen to both of you at the same time. So at the very least, your adult children need to know where to go to find the information. They need to know who to call. And so it's really important to have that communication and share that information and start to plan. And um, I will say I've been trying to watch uh, our clients as they age and the ones that have done it well, and I'm hoping I can follow their models. Uh, talk to, if you would, about uh, the importance of uh, all family members kind of being united when dealing with aging parents. I know uh, sometimes it seems like factions build up and then there's kind of, uh, the, the, you know, the stress and, and anxiety of, uh, internally uh, be among family members. Uh, but if everybody's on the same page, that might make things easier. And also, I think maybe uh, that might be easier for the, the parent to accept if they see, you know, the entire family trying to do what's best for them. Well, I mean, you're right. Everybody should be on the same page. But do you know how rare that is? Um, and what happens sometimes if you have some children who live closer, who see more what's going on, um, certainly what we have happen in um, my husband's family is we would visit and stay for a few days so we could see the decline in his parents because they couldn't hide it from us. And when we started to share that with his siblings, they had not noticed that. They didn't think there was a problem. Um, so, y yes, it is the best for everybody to be on the same page, to sit down and try to work together, and hopefully have your aging parents' best interest at heart. But it's not always going to happen, and it's certainly not happening in my family right now. Um, typically what happens is one person is leading the charge. 
The, the other thing I would say uh, that, you know, that you sort of reference is that you're dealing with an adult person here. They're, it's not a child. It's not a baby. And so exactly. Yeah. And these are people that have probably been on their own, like in the case with my grandfather. Uh, he lived on his own for, you know, 10, 15, 20 years. And then as he got older, uh, you know, the family comes in to try to do some things that make him healthier and safer, like taking away car keys and that sort of thing. Uh, but it's very difficult because then the, the aging person sort of realizes, you know, they're losing that independence. So it's a it's a very difficult situation. And I think that's why, to me, uh, any effort you can make to make sure that everybody seems to agree on things uh, would certainly ease the situation. And to uh, you have to be able to navigate the system. It is really complicated, Kevin. Uh, if you're starting to, to deal with insurance and Medicare, and in some families' cases, Medicaid, that may have to pick up the tab um, if you have very low assets and low income. Um, you have to figure all of that out and work through the system to see how it, it functions. And it's very difficult. And uh, what we always tell people is, you know, you're going to spend the bulk of your money in the last few years of your life. And um, it's not a good thing to not be able to do that, to not have enough resources to be able to care for yourself. And that's one of the reasons it's important to really save and accumulate, to be prepared for that, because it's a big bill. So, Ryder, as I mentioned earlier, cybercrime is often in the news. People need to be aware of what's going on there. If someone is concerned about the safety of their data, what are some things that they can do to make themselves rest a little bit easier? Yeah, absolutely. It's a big concern. And like your example at the top of the show, I think that was a great example, you get an email saying, and this is fairly common, you get an email saying, oh, we need to update some information about your account. This is very common for this to be a legitimate email. It's also very common for this to be an illegitimate email. I have seen very good examples of these. Fortunately, most of the time they're 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 not good examples, and something will be off. The spelling will be off. The the logo will be off. But it, it is not that hard to replicate a legitimate email. I don't know why scammers have a problem doing it, uh, but they're not going to have a problem doing it forever. So, in the event that you get communications from purporting to be someone needing to update some some information, reach out directly to them. If it's someone you know, then you can call them. If it's a company you work with, you can visit them or call them or go directly to their website. Make sure it's their website. If it's an institution you've been dealing with, you can go directly to them and update your information. Don't even click the link of, of something that, that is, is not legitimate. A few, a few things to watch out for in an email. Uh, often you will see that the the sender, if you can click in the email header and see actually who the sender is, it might not actually resemble the you know at chase.com or at yourfinancialinstitution.com or your example at venmo.com. It might not actually even be remotely close to that. Uh, so that's that's something to look for. Just just. It, within the email, of course, looking for errors, looking for spelling, logo, misalignment sort of things. But again, best case scenario, if Venmo emails you and says, hey, you need to log in because you've been inactive for six months, just go to Venmo.com. Don't click the link there. A common thing is talking about shredding old documents. That is very important. I would say the bulk of identity theft and the bulk of personal information theft is not done by folks driving around on garbage day and picking things up out of your trash can. That being said, it would be very silly to throw away documents that did have all that personal information on them without a good, careful shredding. I can't tell you how much information kind of things we are disposing that uh, for, on clients' behalf um, that that is is shredded very thoroughly, and of course, uh, old old checks, old old credit cards, things like that can also be shredded. But 
a lot of it is online. A lot of it is online safety, being careful about what information you're filling out, uh, being careful not to repeat the same password. Some folks might even go so far as to have one email they use for specific financial institutions, one email they use for any of their subscriptions, and another for something else. And it's getting easier and easier to do something like that these days. You can manage multiple email accounts through a single Gmail account, for instance. Apple is coming out with a new feature that allows you to use kind of a throwaway email address where you don't really ever have to interact with it. You don't have to deal with it or manage, manage it. They will handle all of that for you. So one way that things happen is if there are multiple breaches and say you say your date of birth gets exposed in the breach of target's information and then your social security number gets breached in the T-Mobile uh, data breach you know the, the, people can start to put your information together because they, there might be something that's the same. You're using the same email address for those places. You're using the same password for those places. It makes it easier to kind of put together a more complete picture of your identity that way. So varying that and especially, especially, especially passwords because especially for smaller websites, for less, I don't want to call it less important websites, but not necessarily big financial websites, um, seeing passwords hacked is not that unusual. You know, one uh, that a friend of mine on Facebook reminded me of with her post is that sharing um, uh, private information on, on social media. But, you know, we all think it's fun on Facebook if, mm -hmm. you know, where are you? Oh, I grew up in thus and such or whatever. But they, as you were mentioning, little bits of those personal information by these cyber criminals can put these together uh, to try to learn more about your identity. So, uh, you know, maybe play along, read the responses, but uh, be careful about what you share, uh, even on something that is like might sound like an innocuous Facebook post. Read, read the responses, write them down in your little notebook, add it to your complete picture of that person's personal financial information. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely do that stuff. Um, I had a friend, we were talking about some of the kind of frightening things people can do with information that is posted on your social media from pictures to things like you said, notes of special dates, important dates, family information, etc. And the way he put it, he does not have social media because the way he put it the only way to win that game is not to play it at all and it's that's a he took a very harsh uh, line against it but I, I would say it's not having having a social media account you know we don't need to be afraid of that just being careful what you put out there and you know keeping a careful eye on how people are interacting and keeping a careful eye, of course, like we mentioned before, on when you get notifications, when you get emails from, you say you get an email purporting to be from Facebook, make sure that's legitimate. Make sure whatever it is, you're going actually to Facebook.com or Twitter.com, not, not Twitter. Dot website on the internet dot ru or something, you know, which is clearly just trying to steal your information. So just being very careful, I, I think monitoring any accounts, be they financial, social media, subscriptions, et cetera, monitoring those for you know, unauthorized access. I think a lot of a lot of co companies do not want that your account with them to to be the, the the one that breaks the camel's back, so to speak. So they often offer tools. They often will offer, oh, we'll send you a notification every time you log in. Some places will send a notification or even log location where you logged in. So you can say, oh, well, well I have five logins from Jackson, Mississippi, and then one from Abu Dhabi. Now that's strange. I wasn't there. So so monitoring those things and keeping an eye out. Uh, and of course, of course, of course, I'm not can't repeat this enough. Don't repeat your passwords because passwords get stolen every day. We're discussing various financial situations this morning. You're listening to Money Talks on MPB Think Radio.
I'm Professor Richard Gershon from the University of Mississippi School of Law, host of In Legal Terms. If you're enjoying this podcast, I encourage you to listen to In Legal Terms, the show about you and your rights. We find interesting legal topics to bring to you and let you know how the law affects you. Find In Legal Terms on any podcasting platform on your smart device or on our website, inlegalterms.mpbonline.org. Money Talks is MPB Think Radio's personal finance broadcast. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Nancy Lotter Janderson, president of New Perspectives, and Ryder Taft, portfolio manager at New Perspectives. They're both chartered financial analysts. Ryder holds the Certificate in Investment Performance Measurement from the CFA Institute. Nancy, some people worry about losing all of their money. What are some general tips that you could give to help someone get over that fear? Well, we use our calculators. Um, and uh, often we hear this fear when people walk in our door to talk about whether or not they can retire. Because it's a very scary thing to give up earning, to say, I'm not going to earn another penny, and to trust that what you've accumulated is enough to carry you to the final day. And um, again, we go back to that calculator and we look at all of the assets. We look at where their income will come from, Social Security, if they have a pension, um, what their income needs are going to be. And um, thankfully, most of the time when we sit down with people, we can say, you're fine. Uh, sometimes they don't believe us, but um, we can show them mathematically that this is sustainable, you, you will be fine. When it comes to the stock market, we, can, we, we have to be honest and say there is risk when you invest in the stock market. But we can look over a long period of time and see that is where growth comes from, and we can get reasonable growth without exposing someone to undue risk simply by giving ourselves the time that we need to allow for business cycle fluctuations. And um, so we try to be reasonable in all of that, but we also try to be honest. We can go back and look at events like 9-11, like what we experienced um, with the dot-com bubble, uh, what we experienced just in the last year and a half. And we can say we went through all of these huge bumps, the 2008 financial crisis, and we still came out ahead. So investing in stocks, investing in companies, in particular in American companies, that has been a winning game over a long period of time, as long as you have a diversified portfolio and you're not putting it all on one company. So we try to alleviate those fears by looking at historical returns and what will work for them and their entire financial situation, and hopefully they will take a deep sigh and go away. Um, But uh, some fear, I guess, is a good thing to sort of keep you on guard against uh, things that might come your way that would kind of upset the apple cart, as it were. Well, I think I think you need to be cautious and reasonably cautious that that um, you're not being taken advantage of. And we have had some cases here in Mississippi where there were financial advisors who were doing uh, things that they shouldn't have been doing and lost money for people. And so you do need to make sure that whatever you're doing, you need to verify all of that. And we encourage our clients, don't just trust us. They'll say, oh, I trust you implicitly. No, verify. Uh, Look at where a third party holds those funds for me and make sure there are backup systems so that your money doesn't disappear. Because there have been scandals and people have lost a lot of money. And sometimes you can claw some of that back, but that takes time. And in the meantime, you've got to live. Sharing your financial fears might give you a new perspective on how to tackle that fear. Did you catch Liz's inside reference, new perspective? I got that. Thank you. Very good, Liz. We do have a caller on the line, so let's say good morning to David. David, you're on the air with us. Go ahead. Yeah, you need to have your radio Hello? turned down. Hi. Yeah. Yeah. Go can, ahead. Can you me? Oh, yeah. I, I, um, I wanted to, uh, uh, one, before, before I get started, I wanted to thank you all for doing what a lot of medias are not doing is educating our folks on these important things, especially this thing about social media and also about the stocks. Yes, we've been through things all the way to the depression. It's the only thing that saves us when we come together and work as a unit, as an American unit. 
And I feel that that's so important. What I was calling about was the uh, I, I've gotten uh, I, I've gotten accidental insurance, and as I was reading it, I, I kind of find that it, it seemed to be very important for people to have just as much as to have whole life. When you're dead, there's nothing you can do. But while you're alive and you lose an eye or a hand or an arm or you know something that can be detrimental to your family's welfare financially, you you know you don't have your arms no more, so you're stuck. I, I thought that was pr uh, really good to have. How do you feel about the accidental insurance? Well, I'm going to say um, more than accidental insurance because much of accidental insurance is basically life insurance that comes into play if the death is a result right. of some accident, a car accident, for instance. Um, but right. what you're talking about is what we talk to people a lot about is the importance of disability insurance. And right. um, you're more likely to become disabled than to die outright. And, yes, your That's family right. is dependent on you. So um, many disability policies can be purchased through your employer. And so check with your employer. See if they offer something. It could be worth your while to do that. It's not going to cover all of your income because that's not what they do. Usually it's around 60%, right. but that's going to help you. The other thing I'm going to tell you is we have a system in place called Social Security that allows for disability. So there is disability coverage. If you become disabled, then you can apply and get uh, your Social Security benefits paid out early to you based on that disability. But understand, there's often a delay, maybe up to a year or more before you, that would then kick in. So check out disability insurance, talk to your employer, see if they offer it. If they don't, ask them if they would. All right. All right. And then if some, then if someone is uh, right now, like, you, you know, like they just they don't they don't work anymore. They're older. But I have a couple of seniors that I transport and then the ages of 60 and 60 and 75. And a lot of them just, you know, don't have much. They, they didn't get the what you call the financial wisdom that some of us have. What do I do about that situation? Where should I send them? Well, that's going to be difficult. It, your older one in the 70s is probably already collecting Social Security if they have those benefits right. available. The younger one may not be yet but could apply at age 62. Um, those are folks that, that may be eligible for Medicaid, and that really becomes important to have some coverage for health insurance. And Medicaid will also um, offset some of the premiums on Medicare. So you can get a break on those Medicare Part B premiums if you're lower income and lower assets. I love y'all, man. Keep up the good work. God bless you. Thanks so much. Thanks, David. Always good to hear from you. Thanks for the kind words. Uh, let's one more call before our next break, and it's Megan who's called in from Jackson. Good morning, Megan. You're on the air with us. Uh, hi. Thank you. So I've just got a quick question. Um, a lot of my friends are starting to retire and start their Social Security. And they think that you can't work once you uh, retire, but but you can. And I was wondering, you know, it, is it a good thing to have earned income once you start Social Security? And if you can, what is the limit? Well, you can um, still earn if you are less than full retirement age. And full retirement age depends on your birth date, but it's going to be anywhere between 66 and 67 years old. So um, if you're less than that, then your earnings could offset your Social Security right. benefits, which is another reason we encourage people to delay those benefits beyond the fact that you they compound 8% a year. Unbelievable. Um, but right now, the limit, if you're under the full retirement age, is around 18000 a little bit over 18000 You can find it on the Social Security website. Once you hit full retirement age, there is no limit. So if you're at full retirement age and you're collecting Social Security benefits, you can earn as much as you want outside of that. Okay. Thank you. All right, Megan, thanks for the call. Uh, here's a quick programming note on September 21st, two Wednesdays from now. Our friend Sean Mercer from Social Security will be with us, and he always has a font of information. I'm always impressed at how well Sean handles your uh, Social Security questions. So that's coming up. Uh, Money Talks on Wednesday. No, no. Tuesday. 
Tuesday. I'm sorry. It's two. We don't air on Wednesday. I'm sorry. Tuesday, <laughs> November. Gee. Let me take a pause here. This, this week has been, you know, it's, it's hard for us all. On Tuesday, September 21st, we'll hear from Sean Mercer from Social Security to answer your questions. Sorry about all that. Glad I was able to finally spit that out correctly. We're talking about financial fears this morning, and you're listening to Money Talks on MPB Think Radio. Join us each week for Everyday Tech on MPB Think Radio. We have an IT expert, a computer repair ace, and we troubleshoot your problems on the phones as well. Everyday Tech, Wednesdays at 10 on MPB Think Radio. Download the podcast now or listen on YouTube on the MPB Think Radio channel. This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. We're glad you found our show, Money Talks. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Nancy Lodridge-Anderson, president of New Perspectives, and Ryder Taft, portfolio manager at New Perspectives. We have a reminder for you, every Tuesday at 10, listen live to In Legal Terms on MPB Think Radio, immediately following Money Talks. Uh, We have an email here that says, I am four to five years from retirement. I have money in IRAs, a 401K, and CDs. I'd like to have a financial advisor, but my workplace doesn't provide one. I don't want someone who will try to sell me their products. How do I find a reputable financial advisor? Well, that's I, I a think great that's question, good. and uh, not a huge surprise that a workplace does not provide a financial advisor. A lot of times, who someone may rely on as a financial resources, financial resource in a workplace may just be depending on the size of your workplace. It could be someone in who works in HR who just deals with the benefits a lot, and they can't necessarily offer you advice. They may have a third-party benefits administrator, and they can't necessarily – they're not necessarily even allowed to offer you personal advice. They, they can't say, oh, well, this is, this is how you should be allocated given your, your goals and your timeline and things like that. They may be able to give you just, just kind of strict facts about the situation. Off, having a third party, having a truly independent third party advisor offered through a workplace, I, I don't know that I've really ever heard of that. Um, and, and I would question whether or not they are truly independent at that point. I think one important thing to look at, because she said she does not want someone who's just going to sell them her product, look for someone who is fee only. Someone who only, fee only means you are the only person paying them. They are not, they are not compensated from their broker. They are not compensated from insurance companies who are paying them to push a product or uh, mutual fund companies who are paying them to push a product. Because there are a lot of ways to get paid in the financial industry. And it doesn't mean that oh, the person who gets paid from an insurance company or a mutual fund company, it doesn't mean that they're worse at providing advice. They're just opportunities for conflicts, and there are limitations on what they may be able to say, given that they're paid by someone other than you. So look for someone who is fee-only. Look for someone who is a fiduciary to you. That is, they must put your interest before their own. And look for someone who may offer for a kind of limited, defined engagement, say someone who you can approach and say, hi, I would like to sit down and review my financial information. I just want an hour or two meeting. I understand you'll spend an hour or two looking at things and maybe crank out some advice. Or I am looking for someone to engage on a limited time period. I want someone to hold me accountable to a few things and get things in shape. 
of course, it's a two-way street. Any advisor who you say, I want you to provide this advice to me, they're they're and they're going to want to make sure that that you're engaging with them as well because it it is it can be frustrating as an advisor when someone comes to you for all sorts of advice and you you work with them and you get lots of things together for them and then they come back to you several years later and they've done none of it and they are in a worse position because of that so so it's a it's a it's a bit of a two-way street but primarily look for someone who is fee only and a fiduciary very good uh, money talks got a couple of minutes left let's try to work this final call in for the hour and it's marie in Kosciuszko. good morning you're on the air go ahead hi good morning I was calling to get some information about, uh, I guess, going into a nursing home. Uh, I've asked my family that if it comes to that, please uh, put me there. Don't try to take care of me. But uh, what I wanted to find out is the funds that I receive uh, would be used to cover the costs of the nursing home or... Um, can I leave it or give it to family? It's a pension, annuity payments, Social Security, 401K. Can you? Marie, the, yeah, the first thing you need to do is um, uh, you may want to check on what is the cost of a nursing home and uh, look at those expenses. You might also want to consider some sort of assisted living, and more people are comfortable with that versus a nursing home um, mm -hmm. that gives you some support. Um, that and I, and I appreciate you saying to your family, let me do this um, and relieve them of that burden, but you also need to figure out how to pay for that. Mm -hmm. And um, the folks at the nursing home can also talk to you about how you could qualify for Medicaid. I suspect with your income, if you, if you mentioned you have a pension, you have Social Security, you have other assets, you probably do not qualify for Medicaid. Medicare no. does not cover the standard nursing home care. It only covers interim care up to about 90 to 100 days if you're having to do that because of having been in the hospital, going to rehab. But on a long-term basis, they do not pay that. You would have to be on Medicaid, which is designed for lower-income, lower-asset families, and you may not qualify, which means can you afford to pay for that yourself? So um, do Correct. some research. What, what's the cost of a nursing home? What is the cost of assisted living? And the folks that we've worked with who've done this well, Marie, have looked down the road. They started to think about, well, what do I want my life to look like? What kind of help am I going to need? And when you can make your own choices, and so we have helped some people, they've they decided, I'm going to go to a retirement community, and I'm going to be in independent living, but there's going to be some backup. All right. Nancy, got to hold you there. That's the end of the show today. Money Talks is a production of MPB Think Radio, funded in part by you. Our call screener today was Jay White, and our producer is Liz Gill. So for Dr. Nancy Lotridge Anderson and Ryder Taff, I'm Kevin Farrell. We'll be here every Tuesday at 9 for Money Talks on MPB Think Radio.